testing one million, two million. <laughs> Everybody uh, was started talking about him, and who the hell is Warren Buffett? The Oracle of Omaha. You do not have to uh, cheat to make money. He's the man who gave thirty-seven billion dollars to charity. There we go. I enjoy the idea of building an endowment fund up in society. Here we have our uh, ten cent coke machine. Which, Warren Buffett is the genius behind Berkshire Hathaway. I'm Warren Buffett, chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. The stock of the Berkshire Hathaway company closed yesterday at one hundred thousand dollars for each share. Warren Buffett is probably the greatest investor we've ever seen. Our dad, he said, Warren's like someone that can see in the dark. He started with $10,000 in 1950, and now he's worth uh, $40 billion. Warren Buffett. The Oracle of Omaha, investor extraordinaire, has devoted his life to making money. Okay, we just do it a couple times. Oh, okay, any suggestions as to change? Okay. And he has made a lot of it, more than $40 billion. Enough money to buy 880,000 Hummers, one for everybody in San Francisco. And he's come by his money the honest way. Six ninety-five for a sandwich that cost 75 cents to make. That's the kind of business I want to be in. He's not involved with kind of phony deals, and his rep Warren's reputation is very good. If Buffett is the big fish, a lot of smaller fish in his wake have become very rich, too. To say how many millionaires he's created now would be hard to say. He would know. Um, but it would be in the thousands, for sure. Boy, if, if he doesn't give capitalism a good name, who does? Warren Buffett is the ultimate American success story. I benefited incredibly from being in this country. I mean, when I was born in 1930, the odds were 50 to 1 against me even being born in the United States. And I was lucky enough to be born here. I was lucky enough to be born with a, a talent capital allocation that's worth a whole lot of money in this economy, but it wouldn't be worth much in Bangladesh, and it wouldn't have been, been worth much 300 years ago. Like a Horatio Alger hero, Warren Buffett accumulated his huge fortune by relying on honesty, thrift, and a can-do attitude. Add self-deprecating humor, and you have the world's second richest man. It was a charity event, uh, so I uh, played Daddy Warbucks for a short period of time. And Ms. Flanagan, who ran the orphanage, kept calling me Warbucks, but I explained to her that was Bill Gates. Bill Gates, the chairman of Microsoft, and Buffett's good friend, is a few decades younger and a few billion dollars richer. The Microsoft mogul has amassed more wealth than any other man in the world. But on June 26, 2006, 75-year-old Buffett gave away more money than anybody ever before, $37 billion. And it was big news. Now to the giant gift. That's Good evening. It is okay. simply a staggering amount of but money. But we begin with today's big money announcement from the man known as the Oracle $31 billion dollar donation. Today I've got a few letters, and the uh, first three letters are easy to sign. I just signed Dad. The other ones are... <laughs> In a ceremony at the New York Public Library, he gave away two-thirds of his vast fortune to five charities. That's my daughter, Susie. That letter starts out, Dear Suze. I wanted to make sure I didn't ever write one that says, Dear Anna Nicole Smith, so I'm doing this at an age where I still... <laughs> Three billion to the Susan Thompson Buffett Foundation, named after his late wife, and a billion each to the charities of his three children. My son Howard is here. I'm not kissing you. <laughs> and my son Peter. <laughs> but the lion's share of Buffett's great giveaway went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Kind of like the $64 question we build up to the big... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, Buffett's donation doubled the foundation's endowment. Don't lose that letter. And we're talking about $31 billion at today's prices. These are just staggering numbers, world-changing numbers. If you go back in history and compare what Warren has given to what the great philanthropists of the, of the century have given, Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, this amount dwarfs what they gave. In the history of the world, I don't think we've ever seen a gift like this. Everybody was 
was surprised when he gave away the majority of his fortune. And that's because Warren Buffett is known for making money, not giving it away. His own children know that better than anybody. What he did, as soon as he started giving us an allowance, he put the slot machine up in the <laughs> attic, and we'd go up there, and he'd, he'd win every penny back of the allowance through the <laughs> slot machine. I could never, in, in 10 years, I couldn't get three of those melons to line up. He's a bit of a tightwad, as he would also tell you. And so what to do with it has always been very difficult. Giving his money away was a problem he had left to his wife, Susan Thompson Buffett. Susie, who was going to manage that, they had it all planned. He was going to die first, and then she would do it. And she was wonderful at that sort of thing, and her heart was in it from the day I met her. But that didn't, it didn't go that way. She died in 2004. The onus was on Warren to think about, well, it's not going to be Susie that's going to be handling the money. It's going to be me, so what am I going to do? Only one thing was certain. The money was going back to society and not to the Buffett children. From the start, he and his wife Susie, um, they started with the kids and, and prepared them from the beginning that they were not going to inherit great wealth, that that wasn't the way it was going to work in their family. I think that a rich person should leave their children enough so they can do anything but not enough so they can do nothing. It isn't in keeping with my view of how the world should operate to create uh, huge amounts of dynastic wealth. Warren Buffett wanted his fortune to benefit society, but in philanthropy, as in business, he wants value for his dollar. He thought that he wouldn't be very good at uh, micromanaging the giving away of the money. Well, I'm, I, I've got some people where I'm saying you can give it away better than I can, so I'm turning it over to you and, 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 and you do a better job of giving it away. Better. There we go. <laughs> Bill Gates is a determined philanthropist. It's almost scary. Uh, you know, if I make a mistake with my own money, it just doesn't feel the same as to make a mistake with Warren's money. They are more likely probably to do more things to change the world, to cure diseases, to help people get an education than the federal government of the United States. In philanthropy, you're really tackling the problems that have defied intellect, important problems that people of intellect, people with money have tackled and thought about in the past and, and have had a tough time coming up with solutions. Most people would insist on having their own name on the money. He wasn't looking to memorialize himself. He was looking to do good with his dough. It's a very selfless act because he's thinking about, uh, he's not thinking about whose name is going to be on the dollars. He's thinking about what the dollars are going to do. Warren Buffett is a tycoon, but a modest one. He enjoys his money, but what he likes much more than having money is the fun of making it. More and more and more of it. Warren Buffett, who had enough spare change to give away $37 billion to charity, has remained the American everyman. He shuns ostentation. Doesn't have yachts or fancy, fancy cars or a lot of the things that people tend to enjoy getting when they have a lot of money. He dresses badly. He uh, once said that he got his clothes made by a tailor free if he didn't tell anybody who made them. Look, Buffett spends a, a, a minuscule fraction of what he could on himself. And uh, he said, uh, I have, any, I have everything I want that money can buy, but I always did. What can money buy? The, if I had five cars, would I have a better time than having one car? I mean, I just have more possessions to keep track of, so I, it doesn't appeal to me. Warren Buffett seems like a character ready to step into It's a Wonderful Life. Although Buffett hobnobs with politicians, captains of industry, and other influential people, he is an aw shucks Midwesterner who remains himself even when appearing in the soap opera, All My Children. Mr. Buffett, I presume, may I call you Warren? I mean you and me a little together, oh, Warren. Warren, you are my destiny. But Warren Buffett is not your average American. If his appearance is as unremarkable as Clark Kent's, he has superpowers too, though his are all about making money. He has tremendous analytical powers. He thinks of things that other people don't think of. When we were little, uh, our dad said, Warren's like someone that can see in the dark. And I, I always remember that. 
Warren Buffett, the middle child and only son of Howard and Leela Buffett, was born on August 30, 1930, in Omaha, Nebraska, in the early days of the Great Depression. There are uh, you know, bread lines, soup lines, all of that. Uh, his father's a stockbroker. He loses his job uh, when Buffett's a, a small kid. Howard Buffett sold securities on his own, but it meant lean times for the family. Still, when many Americans were eating in soup kitchens, Warren's mother skipped meals herself and managed to put dinner on the table for Warren and his sisters, Doris and Roberta. Buffett already knew what it was like to be poor when, as a six-year-old, he took his first step toward getting rich. He pays uh, a quarter to buy a six-pack of Coke from his, from his grandfather's grocery store, and he sells them for five cents each. That's a 20% return, and that's really what he's done all his life. I think Warren inherited um, some of his ability, certainly with numbers, from my mother, because she was really good at that. Uh, she could add numbers faster than an adding machine. And from his father, he learned something equally important. You do not have to uh, cheat or anything to make, to, to make money. I think his influence on all of us was a strong sense of truthfulness, honesty, and setting standards for yourself. Warren uh, really ad adored my father. Howard Buffett introduced his son to investing at an early age. Warren was only 11 when he and his sister Doris bought stock in the energy company City Service. Early on, I, I sensed that he, was, he knew what he was doing. We got three shares for $100. Of course, the stock went down. It went way down. Of course, he was in a panic. Then it, it came back. He sold for a little profit. But soon, it went up to 200. He obviously learned it's um, not to sell too soon or something like that. I mean, he has always been, uh, the habit's been to hold on to everything ever since then. Warren liked baseball, and he still does. He had many friends and behaved like other boys, with one exception. He was kind of a regular kid, except that he did these sort of beginning business things that probably some other kids weren't doing. He would go to gas stations and collect bottle caps. And then he'd bring them home and spread out newspapers and sort them out. And essentially, he was doing what we would call now marketing reports. He was figuring out what was selling. December 7th, 1941. In 1941, when the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor sent America to war, a date which will live. Warren's Republican father was the only person in Omaha willing to run against the party of the popular wartime president. To everybody's surprise, he won. Soon the family was living in Washington, D.C., and 14-year-old Warren was back in business, this time delivering newspapers for the Washington Post. My mother, she got up at 4 in the morning and would make him breakfast, and she really um, helped him she wanted him to succeed, and winning and succeeding was very important to her. He distributed close to 500 papers each morning at the Westchester Apartments, and the job made him $175 every month, equal to many a full-time wage. He spent some of his money on Nebraska farmland and collected rent on it from a farmer. He always had businesses going, and by that time he was looking at stocks as well. Pinball machines became another money-making venture. With a mechanically-minded school pal, he bought used pinball machines and installed them in barber shops. He was 16 or something like that, and, and he said to me, he said, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. It was a tall order that young Buffett set for himself, but he loved making money, and he was determined, come hell or high water, to become a very rich man. When Warren Buffett was still only a teenager in Washington, D.C., he was in a huge hurry to become rich. So right after graduation from Woodrow Wilson High School in 1947, he wanted to be an investor. But on his father's insistence, he did go to college. And then in 1950, it was off to business school at Columbia University in New York. Warren's favorite professor was Ben Graham, the author of The Intelligent Investor. He was enthralled by Ben Graham and understood that, he, that Ben Graham was teaching him the framework from which he could invest. And what Graham said is, look, stocks, they're just pieces of paper, but they represent something. They represent a part ownership in the business underneath, right? And the way to buy a stock is just as if you were buying the business. The key, if there's one key to what 
I do, it's I look at every share of stock as being a part of a business. That means I think about the business. I don't think about the price action of the stock, or I don't think about what people are saying they're going to earn next quarter, or anything of the sort, or look at charts. I just try and look at the business. It is the cornerstone of, of these investing principles that Buffett has never veered from. He's added to them, but he's never veered from, from those principles. In 1951, Buffett returned to Omaha, where he worked in his father's brokerage. The 21-year-old fell in love with Susan Thompson, a college friend of Warren's younger sister, Roberta. Oh, Susie was an amazing person. Um, she, was, she had been president of Central High, and that was very unusual in, in those days, to have a girl as uh, class president. She also could sing and was in the musicals, and people loved Susie, and she loved other people. But not Warren Buffett. She had another boyfriend, so Warren courted her father instead. Susie's dad and mother, who were good friends of my parents, um, they were very keen on Warren, and, and uh, Warren played his ukulele, and Doc Thompson played his mandolin together or something, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but he did, he won her. They were married in April 1952, and over the next six years, they had three children, Susan, Howard, and Peter. In 1956, Buffett went into business for himself and a year later he was working out of a house on Farnham Street that he had bought for $31,500. His neighbor, Don Keough, thought he was a slacker. He never went to work. He did some funny thing on the telephone and uh, I was a salesman out selling coffee and working day and, and late in the evening. But the guy who stayed at home all day was desperately trying to drum up investors. He said, Don, uh, I've been thinking about you. I'm starting a little fund with a few friends, and uh, if you were to put uh, $10,000 in it, I think I could maybe, you know, turn it into a, a nice little piece of money. Well, I said, oh, let me think about it. I remember going into my wife, Mickey, and saying, can you imagine giving $10,000 to a fellow who doesn't get up and go to work in the morning? Why wouldn't you? There was no doubt about his ability. There was no doubt about his honesty. And I remember the thrilling thought. He said, there'll come a day when this may throw off $1,000 a month. He got doctors he didn't know to contribute at that time big money. This was a kid. He started with $10,000 in 1950, and now he's worth uh, $40 billion. I wake up uh, every night and <laughs> think about it. No, I, now it's fun to look back on. In 1962, Buffett had his eye on a New Bedford, Massachusetts textile mill called Berkshire Hathaway. It had one important thing going for it. The stock was cheap. Three years later, he had bought enough shares to control the company. It's a sort of a Ben Graham type of stock. Uh, it's traded, the stock is traded down. The reason it's traded down is textiles are not such a good business anymore. But, you know, Warren thinks he can uh, uh, make a profit on it. But soon, the going got tough. He told the management, look, I want the cash out of this business. So what he starts to do is to squeeze the business. And whatever little dollop of profit he can squeeze, instead of putting it back in the textile business, he buys an insurance company, he buys a chain of weekly newspapers, he buys a steel plant, and little by little, he begins to diversify, to reallocate the capital out of that textile mill into businesses with better futures. And eventually it becomes a holding company for all of his other investments. While Berkshire Hathaway the mill was withering, the holding company's assets kept growing. As an investor, Warren Buffett was phenomenally successful. He outperformed the Dow year after year, and in 1965, by a whopping 33 percentage points. But that year was not a happy one for Warren Buffett his beloved father died of cancer. His father was a hero to him. Warren thinks his father just really never did any wrong. He will always uh, think of them that way, and, and his father's death was a huge blow in his life. If the mid-60s was a difficult time for Buffett personally, the late 60s would challenge Warren Buffett the investor. The stock market went into a trading frenzy. 
speculation grabbed hold of everything and price earnings ratios went to the sky. Warren couldn't see what stocks there were to buy. Ultimately, Warren uh, reacted to this by closing his investment partnership. The year was 1969, and Buffett sensed that the stock market high was bound to be followed by a catastrophic low. So he returned the partnership's $104 million in assets to his investors in cash or in shares in Berkshire Hathaway, the old textile mill that he decided to hang on to. Warren Buffett was now ready for a new challenge, and he started by leaving his father's Republican Party. There was one issue that separated him from the Republican Party, and that was civil rights. Susie was, uh, you know, more liberal than, than Warren, and particularly in the late 60s and early 70s, she was, uh, you know, always getting behind causes to help uh, uh, blacks, uh, peace. She was sort of, you know, pushing him in that direction. With no partners and few investments beyond the textile mill, Buffett spent little time on investment matters and more working for civil rights, Planned Parenthood, and population control. And for Warren, who remembered the bomb over Hiroshima, nuclear disarmament was another priority. But social issues were not part of the game he loved, and it took only a few years before he came roaring back with an investment that would change his life. In 1970, Warren Buffett, the father of three teenagers, was 40 years old. He had liquidated his original partnership, but he was still working to make his giant $25 million fortune grow even bigger. And that much money can invite danger. I said, Warren, aren't you worried about somebody kidnapping your children? He said, they don't know what I look like. It was pure Buffett. He shunned publicity and nothing in the family's lifestyle showed signs of his many millions. And we grew up in kind of the all-American neighborhood and uh, at the time we grew up, you know, it, it just wasn't much different, I don't think really honestly, than the, than the kids we went to school with. The Buffett children went to public school and had no sense that there was anything unusual about their family. The children didn't know what he did. and. And, and one time I remember Peter came home from school and said, oh, we're rich, and they blanched. And he said, uh, and they said, uh, what makes you think that? And he said, because Uncle Freddie has a grocery store. His daughter says, everybody said he was a securities analyst. She said, I was halfway grown. I thought he was checking alarm systems. The family continued to live in the house on Farnham Street that Warren Buffett had bought in 1957. It was a happy uh, household. And Susie was the perfect, or almost perfect, wife and mother. We both loved chocolate. I remember one time she was going to make warm cookies for the children when they came home from school. So she did a batch of chocolate chip cookies, but there were none left by the time the kids got home. Susie was, was prominent, predominantly the person who took care of the kids. Uh, Warren worked. The head of the household was not absent, but certainly absent-minded. Anything could happen around him, and he wouldn't notice it if he was reading or thinking about something. And he would work even when the family went to Laguna Beach, California, where Susie had persuaded Warren to buy a vacation home in 1971. Business had always been his absorbing interest, and in the early 70s, when an oil crisis knocked the wind out of the bull market, Warren Buffett was prepared and ready to pounce. In the early 70s, they began looking at uh, the Washington Post. Partly there was a sentimental draw that had delivered it as a boy, but uh, partly it had just gone public. My first contact was a letter from Warren because he had bought 5% of the company and never heard of him. Catherine Graham, the head of the family-owned paper, had been thrust unprepared into the leadership role by her husband's death in 1963. I think she was insecure as could be. The learning process was, uh, was, uh, was quite lengthy, especially on the business side. Then, Warren Buffett entered the picture. I remember that uh, everybody uh, was started talking about him and who the hell is Warren Buffett and what are his intentions. Are they honorable? Are they dishonorable? What did he mean to do by this? We literally knew nothing about him. Warren Buffett, on the other hand, had learned everything there was to learn about the Post. Warren never does anything without doing his homework, and he really studied up on it. He even bought my mother's autobiography from the Omaha Library. He said nobody had ever taken it out. 
I mean, he just sops up information. Nobody knew what he was up to, and that was making the post management nervous. The only people I knew in business told me that it was extremely dangerous. They alarmed me so that, and I was very new. They said, don't go near him. But she did. Uh, he swept her off her, uh, her feet. I mean, she was charmed by him and totally put at ease that he didn't have any uh, evil designs on it at all, that he was just an investor. Before long, he's not only put Kay Graham at ease, but he's basically the only one she turns to when she needs business advice. He really educated me totally. He would bring with him 10 annual reports or more, and he would say, now, I want to show you these annual reports, and this is a good business. I became very dependent on him. I used to call him up three and four times a day. Outside of the Graham family, multimillionaire Warren Buffett was the largest stockholder in the Post. But, of course, he still minded his pennies. He and Kay get to an airport one time. She's got to make a phone call, which cost 10 cents in those days. All he has is a quarter. He starts to run around looking for change. Now that is, I think, an indication of a fellow who has understood the value of 10 cents. There was this Buffett with his, you know, giant fortune, really. He didn't flaunt it at all. I mean, he had this really dreadful second-hand clothes, practically. Whatever their relationship, Mrs. Graham and Warren Buffett made an odd couple. They certainly had a friendship that was uh, durable, and uh, they saw a lot of each other. So Warren and Kay become very close, and it's really a, a, an attraction of opposites. She's sophisticated. He's Mr. Ola Shucks from Omaha. But I think they each give something uh, to the other. I would try to what I call housebreak him, because when he and I became friends, I don't think he'd ever sat down for a meal, oh, okay. because he liked fast foods and hamburger places. Oh, okay. and Okay. Have a nice day. Come again. He met a lobster for the first time in his life. And um, we all were eating our lobster, and I suddenly looked at him, and he was attacking the back of the lobster, which, of course, was totally resistant. And I said, Warren, if you turned it over, you might have better luck. <laughs> Mrs. Graham's circle was a new world to Warren Buffett. That was his introduction to uh, you know, East Coast elite power circles and on. And I think he got a buzz out of it. But in the mid-70s, his familiar world began to change dramatically. His wife, Susie, was a very good singer, and she began to perform in nightclubs. Well, hello there, good old friend of mine. You I remember Warren sitting there looking extremely proud, and he'd sent her a lot of flowers and everything. He was, he was very good about backing her on that. The Buffets celebrated their silver wedding anniversary in 1977, but that same year, Warren's world fell apart. Susie decides that she wants uh, a life of her own as well as a life as Mrs. Warren Buffett. I think she just got to a point in her life where she needed some space, you know, a room of her own or whatever. Susan decided to move to San Francisco. That's pretty tough for him, particularly in the beginning. He would open a vein for Susan. After a couple of years, Astrid Manx moves in, who is a friend of Susie's, and more or less at Susie's suggestion, and that becomes, uh, you know, that's the way he deals with it, uh, but those are tough years for him. Astrid became like a second wife to him, but he and Susie stayed married. And amazingly enough, they were two people that could pull that off, you know? Most people couldn't, but they could and did. The, there's no question that he was crazy about her. If you knew Susie like I know Susie, oh, 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 right now. And she was crazy about him. As life went on, it looked like a more unusual uh, husband and wife relationship. And soon there would be yet another important woman in Warren Buffett's life. I'm Warren Buffett, chairman of Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated, which has a... In the early 1980s, Warren Buffett was steadily adding to the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. And for a while, he had had his eye on the Nebraska Furniture Mart. 
It was owned by 90-year-old Rose Blumkin, better known in Omaha as Mrs. B. Can we help you? Maybe what you're looking for, honey. Come on, I'll show you what it is. Got lots of bugs. She was an immigrant from Russia, uh, uh, came to this country, uh, uh, had the courage to start her own business. By the 1980s, she's got her whole family and she's got the single biggest furniture store in the United States. Mrs. B ruled the store, barking orders and invective from her motorized golf cart. But all day is waiting. We don't do nothing. That's all they do is wait. We don't just look. Never taking a day off, she worked 14 hours, seven days a week, and was all business. You got pedic? I need new. Cost you $17.50. She had the price tags of the furniture in her house, in case anybody who came by was interested. Now that's a salesperson. I sell anything, I don't care. This woman is like the... You know, the sort of distilled epitome of the capitalist drive in one little tiny nutshell. Thanks to Mrs. B's formula, which was sell cheap and tell the truth, the store had annual sales in the neighborhood of $150 million. And in 1983, Warren Buffett decided to buy her store. Buffett walked in and he said, you know, it's my birthday, I'd like to buy your business. He says, well, you know, I'm ready to sell to you. How much? 60 million. She does not read or write English. The contract is one page. She makes a mark, gives her the check. The business is done. Done on a handshake. No hostile takeover and no junk bond financing or selling off parts for greater profits. In a decade of corporate raids when greed was good and Madonna's material girl would become the symbol of the age, Warren Buffett's material girl was Mrs. B, and she continued to run the store and yell at her employees. The truth is she didn't give up the company. I mean, we are, we are partners, and in most ways, she's the senior partner. That uh, She uh, knows, she's forgotten more about the business than I'll ever know, so she is, she's the boss. So now the load at Berkshire must be borne by Mrs. B. Warren Buffett loved Mrs. B and honored her at an Omaha Press Club event in 1987. Mrs. B will save me. She'll just throw another sail. In 15 months, he had made about as much money with Mrs. B as he had in 19 years with the ailing Berkshire Hathaway textile factory. It barely scraped by. But Buffett had kept it going until it threatened to become a financial drain on the holding company. He was very reluctant to uh, send the employees packing, and he was sensitive to being called a liquidator, you know, some Wall Street type who comes in, closes down the plant just to make a buck. But to Buffett, the shareholders always came first, and in 1985, he reluctantly closed it down, leaving 400 jobless employees with bitter feelings. That same year, Buffett came to the aid of his good friend Tom Murphy of the media company Capital Cities. Murphy was about to buy ABC. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. To so, Pogo. I called Warren immediately. I really needed a 400-pound gorilla who was a major stockholder who could pre prevent anyone from t coming over and taking over the company. At that time, there were a lot of raids going on, so if you had Buffett in there, nobody was going to come and raid the company. Without a moment's hesitation, Warren Buffett volunteered to play the part of Gorilla. And he said to Murphy, how much do you need? And Murphy said, I need $517 million. And Buffett said, uh, that's fine. It was literally a split-second decision. It turned out we lost $90 million the first year. So that was not a very good opportunity. But that didn't phase Buffett. No. No, nothing like that would worry him. All right, this is shot one, please. Here we go. And Buffett was in it for the long haul. ABC stabilized, but the stock market did not. On Black Monday, October 19, 1987, the Dow Jones fell by 22%, and Berkshire Hathaway shares lost 25% of their value. Buffett's personal loss was $342 million. But he soon turned disaster to advantage. This is one of these times when it, you can walk down Wall Street and buy business cheap. And it's shortly after that he makes his uh, biggest, maybe his single best investment ever, 
He loads up on a company he's followed since he was a kid, and that's Coca-Cola. The president of Coca-Cola, who used to be his neighbor in Omaha, didn't know who was buying about 50,000 shares a day. There was a lot of, uh, of uh, raiders moving into companies, and so, you know, it made you a little nervous. Well, one night I was thinking, you know, it's just possible that that could be uh, Warren. I said, Warren, you don't, you're not, maybe you're, you're not buying a share or two of Coca-Cola Star Car. You? And he said, well, I'm getting ready to call you. The biggest investment at that time, uh, roughly a billion dollars in Coke, which today is worth eight or nine billion, and it got up to 15 billion. Meanwhile, back at the Nebraska Furniture Mart, things were getting complicated. After a bitter dispute with her three grandsons over pricing, a furious Mrs. B, now 95 years old, quit the furniture mart. I like they should go down to hell. I want to show him who I was and who they are. But business was business, and Buffett was no knight in shining armor stepping in to save her. The Nebraska Furniture Mart was being run by uh, three Blumpkins, for whom he had a lot of respect. And uh, he uh, felt that it was uh, their decision uh, what to do here. Out of spite, Mrs. B opened a carpet store right across the street. I feel very depressed. Every time I look at it, it bothers me when I go by the building. But the story had a happy ending. Again, Warren Buffett bought out Mrs. B, this time for $5 million. And she ran the store until the year before she died at 104. Berkshire Hathaway kept growing and taking in huge sums of money. You see our biggest stockholder on the left, uh, Warren Buffett. In 1995, the, the Disney Corporation the bought ABC for $19 billion, adding considerably off, uh, to Buffett's fortune. The right thing has been done for the shareholders of both companies. Buffett's shareholders rarely had anything to complain about. We've got a bunch of businesses around the country, and it's my job to take the money they earn and do the most intelligent thing that I can for our shareholders. He told me once, he says, I have to put uh, $100 million to work every week. I've got to find a way to put $100 million every week. That's, uh, you have 52 weeks in a year. That's $5 billion a year you have to find to put new companies. Not so easy. Testing, one million, two million, three million. How to invest all the money Buffett was taking in for Berkshire Hathaway was a problem thousands of people wish they had. But for Buffett, who was getting older, there were other big decisions to make. Warren Buffett, the world's greatest investor, is a guru to hopeful shareholders. Every year, they flock to Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting in Omaha. They come clutching the Berkshire annual report as though it were the Bible. It is their Bible to hear the great man speak. Based on what I've seen, With Berkshire Hathaway Vice Chairman Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett presides. They started about 8 in the morning, and they answer every single question. I think they got most of that about... Whether Most CEOs of public companies, they regard the uh, public investors as sort of a nuisance, somebody to placate and then to get rid of. Warren is talking to his investors, again, like they're his partners. With very few exceptions, there is good news for the stockholders every year. If there has been a major mistake made by Warren Buffett as the head of Berkshire Hathaway, I don't know what it is. Well, his record has been so good um, in, uh, in general, uh, in its uh, entirety, that um, you, you don't see the mistakes that he made. You guys, that's the best offering. Uh, most of those, I would say, are acts of omission as opposed to acts of commission. One omission is tech stocks. Absolutely hates tech stocks. If you look back at the tech bubble uh, of the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, he basically stayed out of that completely. A lot of people actually criticized him and said he missed a tremendous amount of opportunities to, to find value in certain companies. It's just not his thing. Buffett doesn't even use a computer at the office. It's of no utility. I mean, all I'm trying to do is buy a piece of a business at an attractive price, and the computer doesn't tell me how to do that. Not even Bill Gates has managed to win him over completely. He spent nine hours explaining Microsoft to me. Couldn't have been a better teacher. Couldn't have had a dumber student. But I still understood a fair amount of what he was saying, because he is a good teacher. And I, I bought 100 shares when I got all through at, uh, 
That just shows you how many dumb things you could do in this world. When the dot-com bubble burst, Warren Buffett didn't lose his shirt. And Berkshire Hathaway continues to make money for Warren Buffett, his shareholders, and Uncle Sam. Warren Buffett has paid his share of taxes since he was 13. In 2004, the Berkshire Hathaway federal tax return amounted to more than $3 billion and stacked up to over 10,000 pages. Generally speaking, uh, a, a progressive tax system makes great sense in a prosperous uh, country. I benefit plenty from the society. I see nothing wrong with those who have been blessed by this society to to give a larger portion of their income to the society than somebody that's that's working very, very hard just to make ends meet. Buffett has earned his billions as a Berkshire Hathaway shareholder. As its CEO, his income is comparatively modest. He pays himself $100,000 a year. I mean, $100,000 for a CEO salary these days is really nothing. Uh, CEOs are compensated on average about nine, ten million dollars a year. He lives modestly too and enjoys himself in ways that almost anybody could afford. He has so much fun. He, you, know, uh, you know, you know, he plays the ukulele for fun. He uh, tap dances to work every day because he's got the luxury of doing that. Uh, he likes to play bridge. You can do that if you make $10,000 a year. Best mental game there is. My sister plays bridge with him. And he wants to win. He, I mean, loves winning. He's very competitive. And by some fluke, Bertie won. And so Bertie wanted to take that card, that, you, that piece of paper you write the scores down on, he, and Warren ate it. Warren wants to win in bridge just as in business. And he keeps making loads of money, but he makes it the old-fashioned, honest way. There's no um, hint in uh, Warren's fortune of uh, the kind of games that financiers of this age play, inside trading, uh, abusing his stockholders. I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. I've never heard of one unethical thing or anything off color or that cut corners in any way, ever. So he invested in the future without having robbed in the past. It was a clean $37 billion he took out of his own fortune for Bill and Melinda Gates's charity. Well, I actually, I enjoy the idea of building this endowment fund up in society. I mean, I, I, I enjoy the process myself. I mean, the, the, as you say, the game is, is, is enjoyable by itself. A $37 billion gift is kind of a showstopper, but Buffett's active life is far from over. The death of his wife, Susan, in 2004 was a devastating blow he will not talk about. But he soldiered on, and two years later, he asked his longtime live-in companion, 60-year-old Astrid Manx, to marry him. They grew very fond of each other, and um, now they have gotten married, and everyone is very happy about that. And Buffett certainly hasn't stopped earning money for his stockholders. In 2006, he bought a $4 billion share of the Israeli metalworking company Iskar, Berkshire Hathaway's largest foray overseas. And Berkshire Hathaway made the news again when its shares set a new record. A stock market phenomenon. The stock of the Berkshire Hathaway company closed yesterday at $100,000. That is $100,000 for each share. It is a record that is hard to top, but Buffett is certainly game to try. He has no plans to retire. What Warren really loves is he it's it's sort of like playing the game he likes the challenge the mental challenge of the game i am getting to do exactly what i love to do every single day this is the will say me coca-cola and bring a dive yeah the warren buffett i mean he's the happiest guy in the world to make sure i didn't ever write one that says dear anna nicole smith but it's not because he has a lot of money it's because he does what he loves to do 